Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, today's talk is going to be about a uh, deep dive into the OSPO five states model uh, personas. That, for those who doesn't know, uh, it's part of uh, a bigger study that uh, to the group in collaboration with Aleph Research and also other organizations such as Comcast, Bloomberg, uh, and more, um, released a few months ago. And uh, today's topic is to try to better understand all these stages and how can it help uh, these resources in your OSPA journey. Uh, but first of all, also, um, I would like to say that this talk is not, uh, some, uh, is not for people that, are, uh, that doesn't know why an OSPO and what is the value of an OSPO. If you're in that, in that journey yet, I really recommend to check like previous OSPO contracts and talks, especially uh, the, my previous keynote I gave because I, I can uh, uh, dive into like why an open source program office is important, what is an OSPO and so on. But in this talk, everyone that is here is, does, uh, is already aware that it is important to have a strategy on top of all the open source efforts, and that adopting a strategic posture around open source is no longer optional. Okay, so when, when people already is aware of that and, and is in that uh, point, uh, there are some questions that comes to, to people's mind, right? Uh, so, for instance, um, where is the organization in terms of the uh, open source involvement? Like, uh, where, in, in, which, in where, what place of the journey is this, is this organization? Also, like, how is my organization interacting with the open source ecosystem at this moment? And or what kind of open source efforts should the organization uh, be aware of? And, and prioritize in, in the first place and then in the long term. Uh, and these questions can help to streamline this OSPO adoption. And um, there are some tutor resources that uh, can help to, to do this streamline. Uh, to answer the where question, um, the OSPO maturity model can help. To answer the how question, um, OSPO archetypes might be useful since it shows some kind of uh, uh, identifies patterns of the different OSPOs and how OSPOs can be built. And the what questions, uh, maybe the OSPO mind map can help you identify all the different responsibilities and try to um, uh, identify which ones are the most important ones for your company based on, the organiza on your organization's goals. So um, we're gonna go one by one. First is gonna be the OSPO maturity model. So what is this? Um, basically a framework to understand the different maturity stages. And uh, this is based on the insights collected from past OSPO service we have been doing every single year and also testimonials for thousands of organizations uh, that they have been as they have been moving through uh, their open source journeys and uh, you will see the model in a while but uh, there will be there are going to be the two variables uh, so one the ability to execute of that organization and then the level of involvement in open source uh, but before starting with that, um, maybe some of you here uh, will be thinking, uh, OSPO, okay, uh, how do I know if my organization has an OSPO if it uses a different name? Because maybe we can, I, I call, uh, there are organizations that call it Open Source Technology Center, or there's Open Source Center, or there's Open Source Software Committee. You know, there are really different ways uh, to call uh, the OSPO, an OSPO, and um, I think this can help to actually and, um, identify if your organization is doing an, uh, some kind of OSPO uh, work or not. So if your organization, when you, you're thinking in your organization, is applying open source strategy and policies, good, you're in the right path. You, you, your organization is being more mature 
and they understand that they need a strategic uh, posture around open source and they're working to build a matrix of experts to communicate the, the OSPO uh, people with the uh, rest of the teams in your organization. If on the other hand, uh, your organization is doing open source ad hoc, there are no coordinating efforts, in, even though you're, uh, the, you're using open source and open source is part of your organization, uh, but there is no strategy and policies, uh, maybe you need to think about this adding a strategy on top of the open source efforts to start building what it's called an OSPO or uh, different names, but uh, same, same concept. Okay, so let's continue with uh, the OSPO model. So the OSPO model defines this path from open source ad hoc to strategic decision make, uh, making partners. There is a, a, a initial stage that is not really a stage, it's like the zero stage, that is the adopting open source ad hoc. Um, there, you can see like there is not OSPO level at the very beginning. And then uh, once the organization is aware of that, moves to uh, some legal driven states, then to the community driven states, to the engagement driven states, and to the leadership. And um, the, the, how fast is this um, transition going depends on the ability of execute of the organization. Because some organizations might have really strong uh, barriers, industry barriers, that doesn't allow them to go uh, as fast as they can and others goes really well and it looks like oh and just one year uh, I just developed a really amazing um, uh, open source strategy and policies and the organization is aware of the open source efforts and, and understands open source. Um, so we're gonna go stage by stage to try to identify uh, like the main character, like what characterize those stages and then um, when, uh, it's, when, when that transition from uh, the legal to the community, the community to the engagement and engagement to the leadership happens. Also, um, also to let you know that this is not like isolated stages, like once you cover the legal part, you move to the community part while keeping all the efforts in the legal part. So it's accumulative um, stages. So in the legal driven states, um, the organization already recognized that open source software is a key part of uh, their business and the technology strategy. And uh, there are, uh, the uh, tasks they usually follow is uh, identify all the legal and security risk, uh, try to see ways of how to uh, do risk mitigation strategies. Like for instance, as I said, there are like inventory taking, developer education from uh, the legal concepts and careful licensing. Um, the next step uh, moves more to a community driven state that has two phases. So in that part, uh, your, your organization is already, have already policies around all the legal and security issues in place and um, they allow them to start creating these uh, internal ambassadors to promote the usage of um, open source products and approve open source products that the legal team say, yeah, you're good to go. Uh, this is the set of open source products you, you're good to, to contribute to. Uh, so these uh, ambassadors are promoting this uh, community education and try to educate developers within the organization into open source. Um, we're still in the community driven states, but part two. So as they keep learning and, and having more knowledge of the open source and how open source benefits the organization, uh, the OSPOs uh, start to optimize all the open source contributions. It's, that is the time when the outbound open source contributions are um, uh, increase the quality and uh, they are more meaningful because they actually know how to engage in the open source ecosystem. And it's also sometimes with the OSPO uh, create and launch open source projects uh, to establish broad credibility in the open source community. 
And once the organization uh, is educated into this part, like community and legal education, it's when we really put, can, can start to make actions and have an impact in open source ecosystems. And it's when the engagement-driven states start. So it's when these leaders uh, that have been being formed in the organizations start to launch open source projects in the public sphere, and um, they understand uh, that these projects are benefiting the organization. So this is, in this state, there are a lot of, let's create playbooks, let's create checklists and tooling and uh, other mechanisms that allow us to organize and operate in open source projects, like open source uh, best, best practices. And also ways to keep training these leaders that will fuel uh, the organization uh, to, with and, and will act as the linchpins between the organization efforts and the open source ecosystem. And finally, uh, if the organization uh, is able to have all this, is when we can start talking about a leadership driven state. So it's when this OSPO can become this advisor of the organization and, and drive guidance, uh, for instance, advise the CDO and the uh, technology leadership on what open source technologies are the best ones to use, or um, uh, see what is, uh, decide what constitutes an acceptable open source project or interested open source project for the organizations to contribute and to participate, and also to help organizations understand and navigate project politics. So um, we have now uh, covered the where, like uh, a way to know better, like where is my org organization at in the OSPO journey. Now let's move to um, how. Uh, so how, how, how is me, my OSPO operating in the open source ecosystem? Because OSPOs are so different and there are many ways they can behave. So we can identify patterns um, that uh, we can relate our organization with those patterns uh, to help better understand what my, um, what my OSPO is for. Um, also, I have to say that an OSPO might have different hats and um, we're gonna see like a, uh, some, some sort of um, different um, archetypes here. I'm not going to cover all of them because there are like six. Uh, we're going to cover like just three examples. But uh, once I go through all these um, archetypes, you, maybe you might say, oh, my OSPO does all of them. Like I can relate to all of those. Or maybe another person say, well, my OSPO, I can relate to with two of them instead. Uh, because that is what the patterns are, is try to identify patterns and that is what your OSPO is. So let's, let's put examples, I think it's gonna be better. Um, so one OSPO archetype, um, for instance, it is, this happens a lot in the automotive companies from the European Union, um, can see open source as a way to improve, uh, to make better uh, all the industry infrastructure for them so they build an open source consortium uh, to contribute to key open source initiatives uh, that, it's benef that benefits the industry as a whole. Like for instance, in this case, the automotive industry. Uh, but there are other kinds of OSPOs that sees value in, um, okay, I want to um, better uh, create tooling that could automate uh, the consumption and thus uh, have better contributions and contribute better to the community. So for instance, this is an example uh, that uh, Bloomberg worked with Microsoft to make contributions to TypeScript. So this was like create better, uh, better tooling to help them contribute back in a more efficient way. So these are, sorry, these are called the cross industry collaborative and the other ones were called the industry collaborative. Um, and then another example, and I think that this is a common one, is um, 
this Aspers um, that uh, are trying to facilitate this incubation of open source projects within the organization and then launch them. So for instance, Comcast uh, incubated the Apache traffic control project and that is another example, for instance. And as I was mentioning, there are several ones. Um, you can try to find out your OSPO personas. I uh, added there the, the report where you can uh, take a deep dive on all the different archetypes. And also to say, so these archetypes are really corporate focused, um, but they are not an, a closed list. So this can be wider and wider, and there are maybe other uh, organizations can add value and find other patterns and add more archetypes to the list. So other component, other OSPOs, when looking at this, um, looking at these archetypes, can relate to themselves. All right. So finally, um, let's now move uh, to what? So uh, what are the different OSPO responsibilities uh, that, a that an OSPO can accomplish? And, uh, and how can I know which ones are the best ones to focus at, uh, depending on, uh, in base based on my organization's goals? So uh, there is another resource at the uh, to-do group that is the OSPO mind map. In fact, like one month ago, we just released the uh, second, the 2.0 version of this mind map, so it has improved a lot with a lot of uh, contributions for the community and from Citonita Sports as well, so thank you so much. Uh, I know some people from the Tudu Group community here um, that are helping to grow this community and I just want to say that I'm really grateful to be part of this because I see so many efforts and so many, um, yeah, um, excitement to uh, build this uh, OSP adoption and help other OSPs to grow. So as I was saying, the OSP mind map can help to frame these OSP responsibilities. So uh, these are the set of different responsibilities that we can find in an OSPO. Some OSPOs are, more, are smaller than others. Some OSPOs are just starting and other OSPOs have a really big team. So, uh, the amount of responsibilities the OSPO can take depends on the size of the OSPO and where is the OSPO located and, and, the, uh, and the journey and, and, and the state where the OSPO is. Uh, some of the responsibilities, uh, for instance, inner source, like I know some organizations uh, has inner source outside the OSPO, but we're still, we're seeing more and more organizations having implemented inner source practices and have it there as an OSPRO responsibility in order to infuse the organization with open source knowledge on the different uh, teams, for instance. Also in the OSPO mind map, uh, you can see the different roles that an OSPO can have because OSPO is not just like a team with the same people and trying to uh, do open source. I mean, no, like OSPO should be the center that uh, can uh, communicate with the different departments and the different teams of an organization. And because of that, because it's so diverse and um, has a lot of uh, different domain knowledge from different um, expertise, uh, they need to build a matrix of experts. So take the time, if you're building an OSPO or willing to build an OSPO, take the time to build this matrix of experts in licensing, in security, in marketing, in developer education, in engineering, uh, to uh, ease this communication across teams, to talk the same language of the different teams. And um, to end up with, I would like to share some key learnings. Uh, this, this learning comes from um, the past panel discussion we had at the Linux Foundation uh, la uh, two weeks ago, where Ports, Comcast, uh, Bloomberg as well, and VMware 
were talking about the value of the OSPOS and I think it's, uh, um, I took like some learnings from there and I wanted to share it with you. So the first one, it's, I think I, I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, starting an open source program office uh, means moving from uh, doing accidental, um, taking accidental decisions in terms of open source, like, oh, there is a vulnerability here, so I need to take care of this open source. But you're not thinking far away from that. So from that, for, to adopt a strategic posture around open source is put a strategy and thus accelerate this open source and the innovation. Um, second, um, build your matrix of experts. So make sure you're infusing the organization with a clear understanding of open source, because that is gonna be the baseline to actually take actions and start uh, having engagement with the open source community, because sometimes there are a lot of problems that I've heard in the Twitter group from, from organizations saying, uh, it's so difficult to make my employees contribute at bound in a, with quality, in quality, with quality contributions. And that usually is because this education of the open source hasn't come yet, or it takes time. And uh, finally, um, some of the OSPOs mentioned that it's really important for them to um, lead by example, uh, because if uh, their OSPOs, if, if the organization see that that OSPO is engaging uh, with open source and the employees are contributing to open source, are releasing open source, uh, that builds, um, makes them believe on that. And so lead by example as a best practice of um, when building the OSPO, I think it's a really important uh, uh, topic to take into consideration. Um, once you figure out uh, like where is your OSPO is, how to uh, engage uh, in the OSPO ecosystem, and what are the responsibilities uh, you should be taking care of, I really um, encourage you to take a look to uh, the tutor guides uh, that explains how to start an OSPO and uh, deep dive into these processes and more resources that you can find at tutorgroup.org slash guides. Also, if you would like to collaborate, if you're an OSPO willing to collaborate with this community and building more resources to help OSPO adoption and education worldwide, uh, please say hi to Slack or on Slack or GitHub and uh, follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn for more OSPO updates. And finally, something about me. Um, I'm Ana Jimenez, uh, currently the OSPO program manager at Sudo Group. Uh, formerly, I, I was at Viteria where I spent more than three years helping organizations in their inner source and open source metrics uh, strategy. Um, finally, I uh, ended up my master's degree in data science, and I'm involved in other open source communities such as Chaos, DevRel Collective, DevRel Spain, Open Chain, and um, of course, uh, inner source, and of course, to the group. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yep, okay. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you. Hello. Uh, the first thing that I have to say is the guides from the To Do group are really awesome. Two years ago, we were doing open source, but we didn't know that, so we started a journey to f to establish an open source at Commit. Uh, this is the best part, like, where if anyone is interested to establish an, an OSPO, uh, you should start there. So thanks for that, guys, and in the first place. Do you think that innovation is an OSPO responsibility? Uh, so what do you mean by innovation? Uh, running innovation processes. Yeah, so the way I see, so open source drives innovation. and. I think uh, if you've been able attending to the talks here, uh, I think that it's a phrase that has been in every single place. So 
um, the way I see it is OSPOS, since you are putting a strategy on the, on the open source efforts, you're accelerating the open source adoption in your organization. And since you're accelerating this open source adoption, you're at some point accelerating innovation. So I don't know if that was the question or... Uh, mm, my question is focus in, in, in other part because uh, at Comet we have to split both both concepts because we were losing the focus on open source. We were just trying to uh, run innovation process, try to think what we should do instead of trying to give it back at, to the community. We oh, mm. yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, so uh, establishing, establishing an OSPO, I'm going to go back to the slides really quick. Okay, uh, it's a way to take conscious of open source and not just like how can we drive innovation no it's about uh, starting to be a good open source citizen and how to engage with the community because open source is a, is a community of communities and sometimes uh, that it's difficult for an organization that doesn't know anything about open source because the way they interact is completely different uh, if you want to have some um, presence in a in a community and in a project uh, you cannot you can just you cannot just uh, oh let's pay developers and uh, let's take the project like you cannot do that in open source so it's really important uh, to um, the OSPO can infuse the organization of this uh, how to be an open so a good open source citizen how to um, how to how to participate in open source communities so at that point of course, I think it can accelerate this innovation and, and how to, um, how to in, uh, evolve and, and be part of the open source community. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, yeah. How much do you think um, the AE you know, I know for a follows function into some of the advice in here seems to say, indicate not get caught up in whether it's an OSPO or resource center or whatever. Um, you know, part of my organization and a lot of other organizations have adopted with the scaled agile kind of Spotify and they have all kinds of fancy terms for things like tribes, squads, chapters, guilds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, in an organization that maybe potentially has is moving away from the notion of a program office or has an aversion to the term program office, right? Have you seen any um, organizations kind of fitting it into the chapter tribe squad model or something along those lines? So, uh, can you give an example of what it's uh, like a squad model? Uh, it's just the scaled agile, agile at scale, okay. right? So they move away from kind of individual certain it's just a fancy new thing where and, and, and I believe in it and when you actually go through the training it, it certainly makes sense of uh, just pushing power to the edges giving product teams and teams built around features a little bit more autonomy right um, but um, I guess the the idea that um, you know, tribes and squads around organized around features, and instead of the traditional kind of functional mapping, they, they have now this notion of chapters and guilds, right? Communities of practice, communities of interest, or just kind of, you know, where the, the, the functional mm -hmm. alignments are. So I'm not an agile expert, so uh, sorry if, uh, about that, but um, I know like there are OSPOs that are doing Agile and they're implementing um, Agile uh, best practices within the OSPO. That's all I can say. Um, you can also, I think that, that is an interesting question and uh, in the community, in the Slack channel and OSPO forum, that is something that maybe you can ask and other OSPOers uh, could, will be more than happy to, to discuss about this. Thank you. I'll take it up in there. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was really great. Um, I was wondering, so with your experience with open source and with inner source, um, can you talk about any migrations you've had to do from inner source into the open source setting and how what the experience is like? Um, so 
When I was uh, in my former company, I helped organizations that had inner source and open, like my organization didn't have inner source and OSPOS, but we were helping organizations with that. Uh, so based on my experience, I've seen so many different profiles. Like I've seen organizations starting with an inner source and then from that, um, they use inner source as a way to, uh, develop, to educate developers internally. And once they got that, they say, let's build an OSPO, let's go to open source um, as a way to help them. Uh, other organizations, they just say, let's do inner source and open source at the same time because um, it makes sense. Like we see inner source as a way to educate developers and the OSPO must be the ones in charge of educate developers. So it has many faces, to be honest. But it's true that now that OSPO is having like this momentum and, and having like, like this keyword, it's, it's um, in the top of mind of many people. There are, uh, I'm seeing organizations say, let's, let's merge it together. Or at least collaborate together, even though it's some different teams. Thank you very much. But really quick then too, just to kind of add on to what Joe was asking too. So actually having an inner source project, like a single standalone inner source project and then moving it out into the open. Have you had any experience with that and any like key lessons learned about that? Um, I will say that um, I don't, I guess you're aware of the inner source commons community, of course. Uh, they have great resources on that. And they're also like some, um, I see people from the Tudo group also engaging in inner source commons because uh, and, and most of the community are like the same people. Um, so either you ask in the Tudo group or in the inner source, I'm sure they have good experience to serve there. So the talks I've been to and looking at the list of case studies are all large companies. We're 100 people. The developers are, we use open source in our product. Individually, we're giving back when we can, but do you have any examples or, or resources for smaller companies in getting something in place that, that helps the company be more uh, obviously part of the community? Um, let me give you some quick context of that because uh, the case study, so OSPOS has been there for more than a decade right now and initially started with big software companies. So that's why like when you take a look of the OSPO use cases, most of them are like huge companies. What is happening, what has been happening over the past two years or so is that OSPOs are being formed also in small organizations and in um, medium ones as well. Uh, actually, well, I'm, I'm from Europe, uh, I'm from Madrid, Spain, and in Europe, we don't have so many big organizations. Like most of the organizations are uh, small and medium, and they are, do, they are creating OSPOs. Um, we don't have like, we haven't created um, an OSPO use case for small organizations yet, but there, I know, I know they are there, like they're interacting in the community and, and they're asking questions. Uh, maybe they don't have these resources to uh, promote like, hey, we have an OSPO and uh, look how cool we are. They are like, go, they are going step by step and maybe they are taking more way in the legal side, so that's why they don't have in, they don't show in a lot of impact. I wanted to mention, uh, this is not a small company, like it's more medium one, but um, there is uh, one company that started the OSPO one year ago that is called Ivian. Have you ever heard about them? So they're, like, they're a medium company. They, they have an OSPO, like not, not so many people are in the OSPO, uh, but they are there, they are doing incredible work in just one year. So, yeah, Josep Pratt. Mm -hmm. So, um, I will say it, um, it, to, to learn more about the experiences, I really recommend to engage with the community. And I know I'm, I'm always telling the, the, you this, but it's, um, I know that is what works. Like, uh, being in the, in the channel, being in the networking spaces, in the calls, and engage with these people. Uh, and, and share learnings together is what actually will let you know that. 
Okay. Um, first of all, thanks, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, if I recall correctly, the OSPO archi archetypes are a set of um, patterns. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you have also developed anti-patterns, things like the companies shouldn't do like or perform or things like that. Um, actually, we don't have it, uh, uh, but as I said, this is the archetypes is something that started this year, um, and it's pretty new. Uh, we want to open contributions for that. Like these kind of ideas will be really useful, for instance. Uh, so we welcome the community to contribute to that and to expand this this vision because this this is a really reduced vision. As I said, these archetypes. Uh, our corporate archetypes only right now. We would like to span this and maybe with adding the anti archetypes, like this is what you shouldn't do. Um, so, yeah, uh, thanks for the feedback and the advice. So, later today, um, later today, there's actually a, a talk called OSPOs, You're Doing It Wrong, which mm -hmm. is sort of like anti-patterns. And the person who's doing that is Van Lindberg, and he used to be counsel for the Python Software Foundation and a, a partner at Dykema. But anyway, he's also started something. To your question, gentleman in the purple shirt who's texting, I guess you. Um, the OSPO is a service. OSPO Co., I don't know if you've looked at that at all, but for a smaller company, that's a really awesome way to have uh, a resource. Anyway, two plugs for Van. Wow, I should go collect money from him. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we can we can end the talk um, and the Q and A. Thank you so much. <laughs>